Hi pals, it's me, RT, they're them pronouns only, and my video this week is <laughs> updating you on the specialist appointment I finally had after two years, well, more than two years of waiting for it, for my Takiyasus. So yeah, I guess we'll start with <laughs> where, when, when this kind of this referral started and why i think it was it's sometime in 2021 i think the vascular surgeon that i briefly seen a couple of times in my local area had wanted to do surgery on my my arm that is affected by takiasis as a brief rundown i do have other videos that you can see also a blog post more about takiasis from like a very beginner introductory 101 style really good for uh, new patients as well as loved ones of patients um, but basically I have narrowing of the artery um, that is here I think it's called the brachial artery in my right arm um, so my pulse in this arm is uh, very very weak slash non-existent the surgeon local to me wanted to operate um and i was not keen my rheumatologist seemed to have no problem with it and was also saying like you know if i say no now they are probably unlikely to want to operate down the line if i change my mind which is a really strange thing to say but i yeah i said no and that i would rather speak to and see the specialist clinic in the UK in London um, first before any surgeries happen to my body in relation to Takiyasu's. Um, so unfortunately it took yeah over two years for me to get this appointment. I sent the original, uh, well I didn't, it wasn't me sending it. The uh, original referral was sent I think in August of 2021 um, and I think then the following May is when the person who was in charge of it all at the time died. And that was Professor Justin Mason. I waited out for a bit because obviously they were going to have to deal with a lot of upheaval within their uh, within their department, very obviously. So yeah, I did leave it for a while. Um, but as we came further and further into 2023, I was like, I still haven't heard anything in, anything back from them. And I started seeing in the Takiyasu's Facebook groups that people were getting referred and seen within seven weeks. So I was like, something is wrong. Something is wrong here. For one, obviously nobody on my team chased it up. So I went and found Dr. Youngstein's email um, and sent it to my local rheumatologist um, secretary and prompted them to send it again follow it up I don't know so it seems like my referral didn't really ever hit their system until this year uh, so I finally got to see them on the 7th of November it was the first time we've ever been to this hospital so it was definitely a learning curve of like traveling there we thought we'd left enough time but we clearly didn't <laughs> leave enough time because we still turned up a bit late but also that was mainly because our first train um, going into London was late by like 10 to 15 minutes which then just moved everything on the schedule along but it was okay we did get there the person doing obs was very kind very nice they um, did very similar obs to what I get done anyway with my local rheumatologist which is blood pressure in both arms um, my pulse rate and they also wanted to check my height and weight and did a urine sample test i think like they explained that it's just because it's um my first appointment with them so they just want to be very thorough and i was like that's fine um and also i was in my nikes so my i was a bit taller than i actually am so i was like yeah i'm definitely not that tall it's like a couple of couple like an inch or so shorter than that so but yeah they were very nice my heart rate was really high um there's been a lot of stressful things going on generally and I'm like I said in my ADHD medication update video I'm not doing so great with my ADHD meds <laughs> so yeah my heart rate and my blood pressure have been quite high generally recently so she was very nice doing my obs and asking if I was okay I was like yeah just a lot of anxiety at the moment and she did assume that it was medical anxiety which I don't think it was but even if it was um like it was nice that they are kind of like aware of that and um, it seemed like everybody on their team that we spoke to 
was aware of that being um, quite a big issue with a lot of their patients. So yeah, unfortunately I had literally just gone for a pee before I did my OBS, so I had to wait until after my actual like appointment to give them a urine sample. I did manage to give them a urine sample before I left the hospital. There were also generally more patients wearing masks um, and I saw some more staff wearing masks. I then, yeah, was called into the consultation room where I spoke to one of their registrars, whose name I don't remember, but also I don't know if I should really say her name anyway, because, you know, like uh, Professor Mason and Dr. Youngstein are sort of like the, the heads of the departments and quite big names in like the Takayasu sphere. So I feel a bit more comfortable and okay mentioning their names, um, less so other members of staff, you know. But yeah, we were first seen by a registrar who did quite a thorough medical history generally. Um, usually it's kind of annoying, but I appreciated the chance to actually correct and clarify and point out different things that may not have been properly um, <laughs> written down or uh, recorded over all of this time. They were very, very validating of um, the link of the possibility of me having POTS with my already currently diagnosed hypermobile spectrum disorder. They were also very like chill about me saying I'm pretty sure it's a type of EDS that I would like to get explored as well. Um, you know, they were just very understanding. There was no questioning it, no funny looks at me from that. She was also very understanding of the medical anxiety and traumas and so was Dr Youngstein who did come in to see me and my mum and speak to us as well and get to know me as a patient as well. I did get quite emotional trying to explain what worsened the um, medical trauma I have around cannulas and blood tests. I think at some point I should probably do a full video talking about that. So if that's something that you think would be useful to you um, and then what I've done since then to try and deal with that, let me know in the comments. Um, it's just, it's, yeah, it's one of those things that's been particularly difficult and whilst I am in a slightly better position mentally with it all it is still a really really difficult thing to talk about um and even really acknowledge that happened uh, <laughs> but yeah I did I did sort of say like it's really difficult as well because um every time I meet someone new who's going to either do my blood tests or a cannula they don't really listen to what I say when I say like I've got difficult phase to access I need like your your best person here um a lot of people will still give it a go so that's what's led to a lot of worse things happening that worsened that already bad anxiety and PTSD and a lot of other doctors in this area where I live don't really seem to know what options are available for people whose veins are just not easy to access. Um, like the last time I did an MRI, the MRI people were like, well, they could have booked you in with the IV nurse, but it has to be on a Thursday, but she could have come and done your cannulation um, with an ultrasound machine. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of those things a lot of my doctors don't really know about here, um, whereas they seemed very knowledgeable about all the things that they can do and all the options and they can control it all as long as it's in their hospital. They also asked if uh, we wanted them to wear masks, uh, which I did really appreciate. Um, I said, uh, yes, yes, please. But it wasn't until Dr. Youngstein came in and she was the one who asked. I was like, yeah, I'm just kind of used to a lot of doctors like not even acknowledging. <laughs> that I'm wearing a mask in um, appointments. Depends on the appointment. Sometimes in the doctors, like my GPs, um, I don't wear a mask because there's... A lot of the times I've been going recently, there's less people in the waiting rooms. There's not many people around anymore by that time, so I feel a little bit more comfortable just wearing my, uh, like, necklace pur air purifier. Um, but because this was a big hospital in London, I didn't wear it originally because we were rushing trying to get there so it was quite difficult <laughs> I couldn't breathe I was like if I put a mask on right now I will just keel over so I did put it on eventually and wore it in the appointment and around the rest of the hospital and stuff afterwards so it was nice that they uh, did ask and Dr Youngstein herself said that I was I was smart for doing it and it was good that I was doing it because Covid has been a lot worse again recently so that was very nice and validating to hear someone saying yeah no actually you, you've got it right 
<laughs> for wearing a mask. They also said it was a good decision that I declined the surgery on my arm. Um, I explained to them that the my main reason for that was, well, besides that I just don't really want to get surgery generally a lot of the time, surgery scares me. Um, but it was because of the Takiyasu's groups online. A lot of people had said that even if they were at a stable point with Takiyasu's, getting surgery often triggered it again um, and then would cause more issues at the site of surgery. So I didn't want to risk that and I definitely didn't want to risk that with a doctor who <laughs> was not part of a specialised team for Takiyasu's. And they were like, yeah, no, it was good that I chose not to do that. They do surgeries, but um, usually it's if you're going to lose your limb or your life and very rarely do they do other like other surgeries for it. But it is always with their like very specialised team who have had a lot of practice and, you know, education on Takiyasu itself. They, they also said that I shouldn't worry about whether my blood pressure even comes back in my uh, pulseless arm, which nobody has said to me before. That was quite an interesting thing to be told because, yeah, it's not really that important if I get my blood pressure like readings back in that arm. They were very apologetic about how it's taken me so long to get to them and to get to that appointment. Um, and they did explain it a bit more and how they didn't really understand how I got missed. So I was like, yeah, don't worry. I genuinely think it was also maybe partly like the, the rheumatologist my ends issue too. Uh, you know, nobody chased it. I had to chase it. I had to find Dr. Youngstein's email. <laughs> I had to remind them to check. So maybe they just didn't do it properly the first time. I have no idea, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it was an issue on my local doctor's end, to be honest. Um, but it was very nice that they were apologetic about it, um, whether it was their fault or not. It was nice to hear them say sorry. <laughs> um, it's very rare to have a doctor say sorry about anything. Um, they were also impressed by my GP uh, being the one who picked up the pulseless, pulselessness of my arm from uh, an offhand comment where I just said, you can't get my blood pressure from this arm, it doesn't seem to work, so you have to use this arm. Um, and that's how I got to vascular and got my Takiyasu's diagnosis. They also was like seemed to be missing a few uh, scans and documents. So I was able to tell them what scans I had roughly when, um, and who asked, them, asked for them, what hospitals and things like that. So, and they, <laughs> They very specifically were saying that they were going to take responsibility for getting those scans and documents and results, which is another thing that's really rare with doctors in the NHS generally. Um, it, you always have to do the labour of it all. Yeah, the fact that they were like, we're going to, we're going to get that. So we know as much as possible about the, about you and about all the other things that have been going on with your health for God knows how long. Yeah, they were also really fascinated by um me saying that my fitbit like all of the ones i've had actually have been able to read my pulse pretty accurately in my pulseless arm which i always found really interesting because if nobody else can feel it and if it's really difficult to get even with like a stethoscope how is a fitbit managing to do it so um they were really interested in that and they have always sort of said that apparently like um they really think they would learn a lot about their patients um if they could access things like Fitbits. Um, yeah, like I think generally their overall like just interest and fascination in Takiyasu's and their patients um, was really positive for me. I think as well as somebody who is really interested in um, sort of like, I don't even know what it's called, but like, you know, the, the bio, biochemistry, bio, whatever, <laughs> the, the biosciences, uh, when it comes to health conditions and stuff, it was quite nice to be met with people who clearly have like a scientific researcher kind of mindset as well. I also brought up the vascular physio that I've been like chasing around being like, is this a thing? People men mention it to me, but nobody can tell me. Um, and they were like, well, we don't have one for Takiyasu's yet, but 
There have been studies done on other conditions like diabetes that have shown really good results. So we think we would like to do a study on that. That was Dr. Youngstein speaking and she said that maybe the registrar that was in the room could um, could do that as one of her uh, research studies for her um, qualifications. So yeah, like there's a few things with that that they think that maybe the medications we're on might like inhibit some of the uh, progress but also it's it's something that would be worth researching, especially if they do like regular yearly testing anyway on uh, like the vasculature of their tachyasis patients, um, especially when, you know, doing something like, uh, like vascular physio is not um, a very invasive procedure or um, research study to participate in. Uh, they did also say that they feel like I'm on the right medications, even though they're a little bit wonky for like the UK standards anyway. Apparently in America, adalimumab is like the first port of call for tachyasus, Um and I'm adalimumab um, injections because I have Crohn's disease. Also, we think, which was an, a curveball that was thrown at me in that appointment, um, but I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> and like, whilst they don't really use mecatopurin either, they do think that these are the right medications for me to be on. They want to do a repeat MRA with contrast, uh, just to have like a, an updated imaging of what my vasculature is doing and looking like, because I haven't had one since sometime in 2020, but they also, they didn't have that. So that's one of the ones they want to get um, to be able to see, but I was able to at least give details of what it showed, which is that the branch off towards the left did show some narrowing but I haven't had any symptoms on the left hand side of my body so yeah they are booking that they've also talked to me through the process when it comes to, like the cannulation stuff that they will book me in with the renal chemo nurses beforehand because they will be the people who have a lot more experience of cannulating people with difficult veins um, as well as having more equipment like ultrasound and stuff like that um, so I'll see them first, then go for the contrast MRA um, and then go back to them to get the cannula taken out, etc, etc. So we'll see how that all goes when I do that. Uh, but yeah, yeah uh, I don't even know. See, so yeah, that, that was because I was talking about the uh, vascular physio. So who knows, maybe in the near future they will do that and I can participate in the research um because it is something I'm interested in I would literally I want to avoid too much invasive intervention as possible so yeah hopefully we'll see if that's something that could help generally they were talking as well about tachyasus like the burning out sort of stage that the pain I get in my arm should get better and go away but we'll see um and I do want to continue dropping my steroids um but i am st i'm still going to take my break for a while i'm just i'm tired of doing all of this stuff at the moment so um i'm happy to wait a bit longer before i start dropping from five micrograms milligrams wherever it is down to nothing yeah there were a few curveballs thrown my way in that appointment um like i said one of them is about crohn's um, I don't know much of the full details from my colonoscopy that was part of the diagnosis because it was at a hospital that I no longer go to because of the, um, well, one, because of the phlebotomist who assaulted me there, who caused the medical trauma I have around cannulation and, uh, blood tests. Um, also it was just really far away and I had a big flare up a few, like maybe I think six weeks after my diagnosis that had me in my local A&E department where they changed where my care was based to the local hospital instead. So even they don't have those details, um, I'm a bit concerned I'd have to repeat the colonoscopy. <laughs> Um, but we'll see when we get there. But basically, because I don't know what the biopsy result said, another thing that they're going to go and try and get the information from the hospital themselves uh, rather than expecting me to do it. If the biopsy came back negative or inconclusive for Crohn's, then it's very possible that actually a lot of my Crohn's-like symptoms are tachyasus. 
and it was just a happy accident that I was diagnosed with Crohn's first and got on Crohn's medication that has probably been helping the tachyaxis as well for all this time. So yeah, like I remember because I was awake during the colonoscopy and I was asking those questions. I'm very annoying when I'm not asleep if, I, if there's tests happening. Um, I asked loads of questions. I was watching the screen of the inside of my colon um, and they did give me a report afterwards which had photos as well. And the photos showed inflammation, but apparently that inflammation can just be tachyasus. We'll see what happens with that. Um, uh, I Yeah, if it's not, if it's not confirmed or concrete, I feel like I may have to do another colonoscopy for that. But that wasn't mentioned, so we'll we're just going to wait and see. Who knows? But that was wild, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> they also were asking if I was checked for sacroiliac joint inflammation, which is basically all of the joints in like your lower back and hips. And I don't remember being checked for that because like apparently most people get checked for that before or like when they're being diagnosed with Crohn's disease because it's very common. I don't remember that happening and I don't think it's something that's been really mentioned for fuck like a long time ever if it was ever mentioned um, and I was diagnosed in 2019 so I literally just have no idea. Looking it up it would make a lot of sense because I have a lot of chronic lower back pain that also radiates in my hips and my my bum muscles because like that's a major thing I talk to my chiropractor about a thing that I have talked to the physios about and things I've mentioned to um the pain management teams and I there there is there is things they can do about it and no one will do anything about it because I, I currently still have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia <laughs> and they won't do stuff like that if you've got fibromyalgia um so I Again, it, more more things evidencing that maybe I just don't have fibromyalgia and it was just people couldn't be bothered to work out what the fuck is wrong with me. Because yeah, I was diagnosed with fibro in 2016 and I think a lot of those symptoms can now be associated with other things. I might make a video on that as well to just sort of go through all the different kinds of symptoms that they associate with fibromyalgia and then show you where I've gained diagnoses that make it make sense elsewhere <laughs> and Yeah, like this appointment was <sighs> wild. I genuinely, like, I'm not done talking about the appointment, but like the reason why I am uh, choked up <laughs> and crying about it is just because I, it is so rare to be treated the way that they treated me. We were in there for quite a while. My mum thinks we're in there for about an hour talking about things. Um, and I think that might be like just because it was a first appointment. But like, you know, even a lot of other specialists, first appointments are just like, no, fuck off. You've, you've got 15 minutes. <laughs> and like, they were just so kind to me. They were so genuinely interested in me and my health and my well-being. They were fascinated and intrigued about different things like clearly this is something that they're actually like passionate and interested in and they just like looked at me and treated me like a human being not like just a body part that they have to fix it was a lot more about me as a person and what they can do to take care of me rather than rather than dealing with the condition and not thinking about me as the person because like everything they said was all mainly to do with making sure that we have the right answers for me and know what the right thing to do is by me <laughs> 
and they took on the labour that I usually have to take on with other specialists. They didn't even flinch when I mentioned that I am waiting for an autism diagnosis. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely need to speak to somebody about this sacroiliac joint inflammation and the fibro, so I guess we'll see about that. And yeah, the, the Takiyasu's people are aware that I'm also looking at um, exploration into allergies. I just don't even fucking know what, what allergies I have any, anymore at this point. I also told them about the medical cannabis because they were asking me if I vape. And I was like, well, the only vape I have is medical cannabis. But we're, we're trying to find the right oil so that I don't have to rely on the vaping so much. Um, again, they weren't, they yeah didn't even flinch or even like have any issues or concerns really about that at all um and then yeah <laughs> another curveball was that they did have a possible um solution for my issues with cannulation and blood tests and they suggested that i could possibly get a portacath which is fucking terrifying <laughs> like i won't lie it's one of like it's everything that terrifies me it is surgery it's something in my veins slash arteries it's a foreign object in my body that i can feel <laughs> and it is it could lead to me having to have like do my own uh like port flushes which is which means i'd have to stab myself <laughs> so yeah they they mentioned it very casually that it could be like a solve for like generally a long time um i didn't do much reading on it until uh, the other night where i couldn't sleep um so i did some reading but then i was just up in the middle of the night when no one was awake and i was crying so um because it's really scary um a lot of information is not really shared again on all these official like cancer websites about them they don't really share a lot of the information that you actually really want to know um and all of the different sites had slightly different information on just like the takiyasu sites all have slightly different information <laughs> information on them they didn't have the same shit yeah i may make a video just talking about some of the podcast stuff um but at the moment i feel like i am not really in need of one i'm hoping i will be at a point soon where I only need my blood tests every three months um, and then I will need to have the repeat MRA with contrast for my vascular imaging once a year and like I said if that goes well at their hospital then hopefully it won't be as much of uh, an issue as it has been um, down here where I am where uh, a lot of the times they haven't been able to access a vein or it's taken a few attempts or a big panic attack before they find something. But yeah, there was a lot of parts of that that were quite scary and I definitely had to look at other people's actual real life experiences getting a port um, to kind of actually know a bit more what it would look like, including some of the personal prep stuff. I think at the moment, yeah, there's less of a need for me to get one um, because they say that if you're not being accessed regularly, either for treatment or blood tests, then you have to take on the responsibility of um, flushing the port yourself every four to six weeks. Um, either, I think, I one site said with saline, um, one site said with saline or with uh, an anti, I think, I can't, I don't really know how to pronounce this, coagulant, like an anti, anti-clotting medication because you're at a higher risk of clots happening in the port. And yeah, there's a lot of other things that make it more complicated either to get and keep generally. A lot of the sites only really talked about having them for up to five years, um, whereas like in the appointment they seem to basically say that well you can kind of have it forever so i don't know i think at the moment it's a no um i need to get this repeat testing done anyway um they have to get that test done before they could even put in a porticath anyway as well um so if i'm gonna get this regular testing every year then it is at least something that can always be on the table to discuss every year if things change because yeah i think at the moment we don't know whether um 
there's a lot of things that are up for debate because we don't have all the full information like my Crohn's disease stuff because if it turns out that maybe it isn't Crohn's disease then I don't know if that means I could stay on my adalimab injections because in the UK I can't say this one right either but like toxilamab is the main slash only um, approved medication for takiasus um, because of the way the re research stuff goes but I can't have that one if I do have Crohn's because it causes rectal bleeding <laughs> Um, so it's uh, it's definitely important to know if, whether I do have one or both but yeah that could definitely shake some things up um, if that leads to me then being on uh, an IV medication then I think a port would be more useful because at the moment I self inject every week um, and that is fine and easy for me but if it's something that I would need even more cannular access then yeah, I think a port would then be more useful. Or if other things changed and I needed more regular um, blood testing, or even if I get my POTS diagnosis, it could be a really useful way of, I did have a friend in America who was advocating to get a port for herself because she also had really hard to access veins because of EDS and needed a lot of uh, hydration therapy through IVs for her POTS. Um, so who knows if I did get a POTS diagnosis, um, having a port could also be useful in that regard because then I can get IV hydration a lot easier and possibly regularly. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that was my experience of the appointment with the specialist Takayasu's clinic and clinicians in London. Um, I do genuinely like whether you've got a great rheumatologist or not. I do genuinely recommend if you are someone with takiasus in the UK and like I think they they treat people outside the UK as well or at least assist um, people outside the UK with takiasus too um, I really do recommend you get in touch with them they just they just know so much more and like I said they were just so kind to me <sighs> that are uh, yeah I've, I've <laughs> really had quite the shake up this week because well <laughs> there's been a lot on my plate including um my first reviews I've edited for Ramble online I'm now editing for them um as well as my first live poetry performance at the Arzine launch Saturday night uh that's my first performance in like five years since I left university like there's just been a lot this week and this was one just one of many things going on that were was really just just wild to go through and yeah like I I have a lot of emotional processing to do um probably a lot of things I still need to think about and things to weigh up but yeah I wanted to share this as soon as possible really because I, I didn't know what I was expecting and this is what I said at the end of the appointment after Dr Youngstein left and I was still with the registrar you know I said like I, I didn't know what I was going like what to expect from this appointment but like I am generally just in so much shock um at just how good this appointment was because I'm just so used to being brushed off and having to argue and advocate for myself and push and research and provide that research to people and doing all the admin work and still being ignored and still being brushed off and still being told you probably won't get that diagnosis because of all your other conditions you've got diagnosed that two people who are like especially <laughs> Dr Youngstein being in charge of like the whole thing very much but both of them sitting down who are specialists in this area listening to everything I had to say about my experiences and my health and just listening um I I have heard that um Professor Mason was also a very kind man oh my god being treated well by medical professionals should not make me cry <laughs> It should not make me cry. This should be normal. <laughs> but yeah, um, other people have said that Professor Mason was also incredibly kind. So maybe that's just part of their ethos 
um, in the department is just to really hear out the people who come in their doors. I think they really understand that it takes a lot of us a long time to be diagnosed and it's difficult and traumatising so I really appreciate that they are clearly aware of that. So yeah that's my video for this week it's my update on my Takiyasu's journey whatever finally meeting the people who are part of the team of the specialist Takiyasu's unit service in London I just wanted to share because yeah if if you're putting it off because of the medical admin or you're scared of offending your doctor or whatever reason like I, genuinely it's worth getting that referral put through they were so kind and so knowledgeable it's definitely worth having them as part of your your care team yeah and I think as well generally there's not a lot really understood about Takiyasu's by the general public um you know my again my calculations are there's about 3,000 of us in the world and I just I just wish that there was a lot more of this going on for other conditions as well. Um, so yeah, I guess we will see. Uh, we will see about all of that. Um, I'd really appreciate the interaction with this video. Uh, my videos have been not really getting the same kinds of views and interactions as they were like a month month and a half ago which is a shame because I am talking about things that I want to talk about and think are important or are, are like fun for me to talk about um I don't really know what the difference is unless it's just what's been going on in um the general online media that's taking up a lot of the spotlight as it should as it should um but yeah, like anyone who is here, um, I do really appreciate if you like the video, leave a comment, share the video, subscribe if you haven't already. And yeah, just watching some some of these more recent videos a couple times, they all really help the algorithm push the videos out to other people who may not know uh, know who I am or know about my channel, what I do and talk about here. Yeah, that, that seems to be the thing that helps the most because I can share it to places, but it doesn't really make a lot of impact. It's the, the direct interaction from you guys that really helps my videos. So um, yeah, I do really appreciate all the help that has that you have. Yeah, I do really appreciate all the help that you have already given, but I would really like to reach that 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year um, and everything's slowed down quite a bit since then so I think I've got 104 subscribers to go for that so yeah I just really appreciate the help and support on that as well yeah that's it for this video this week and I'll see you next week bye